Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. It's me, Jeff. I just beamed up to the Jeff Track Prize. <laughs> anyway, it's good to be back here on Jeff Track. And uh, today we have a very, very special guest joining us. And uh, I've been wanting to talk to this guy for months, uh, actually for a couple of years, ever since I started Jeff TV, which we'll get to later. Uh, but this is Jeff Track. And uh, I do have a lock on his coordinates, and uh, I'm going to beam him up right now. So, uh, oh, oh, before I even do that, um, I want to beam up my, my super-duper awesome, charming co-host, um, Mr. Goodnight. Hold on. Let me beam him in here. And uh, hold on. Here we go. Oh, just keep those kind of accolades coming, Big Daddy. <laughs> good, to, good to see you, man. Good to hear from you. Um, welcome, Big Daddy. How are you today? I'm good. You know, man of the hour, top out, too sweet to be sour. And here right now, right now on, on the Jeff Pre- the Drift Prize and a, and a Trek Prize <laughs> and a Prize. All right, listen, we have we have a, the coordinates for our uh, our latest guest, and uh, he's a big one. Um, his name is Manu Tarami, and uh, he played Echeb on Star Trek Voyager. He was in a great uh, big movie recently that I really enjoyed called Fortress and so much more. Let's just, let's just get a lock on, the com- uh, on him on our computer here. Hold on one second. We've got to be on that guy aboard. Get the yeah, we've we got to be on him aboard. Yeah, yeah, let's be him aboard. What the heck, Jeff? I'm backwards. My butt's facing forwards. <laughs> that's a good night nice slide. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem they have with transporters. You should get that looked into. Your transporter's all messed up, man. I knew I shouldn't have done that. No. That's because I cross-circuited to B. I should have cross-circuited to C. I got to learn something from Scotty. <laughs> yeah. Engineering well, has really hit the skids around here. Yeah. Hit it again, so it's uncomfortable sitting on the other side. Oh, yeah, all right. right. Wait, well, so, so, Manu, where are you calling from? Uh, Los Angeles, California. Yay, Hollywood that's great. Uh, that's a good night from L.A. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. That's true. I'm hoping to get back out there again soon. I love it out there. Yeah. Mr. Goodnight. So, uh, that sounds yeah, like you sound like a championship up. boxer. That would be a great name for a boxer. That's true. I should get into boxing, but I think at this point I, I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit, you know, being in my late twenties by this point, I'm a little bit past my prime. But you know, I could probably go for it, heavyweight class or something like that. Well, just the name should carry you for a couple of fights. That's true. That's true. Imagine the bias. I got to get to the king or whoever's promoting these days. <laughs> There's only three of them. There's like a monopoly. It's Don King and a couple other guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the heavyweight class ain't what it used to be. So maybe I could, maybe I could bring something back into that. You know, maybe I could yeah. rejuvenate heavyweight boxing. Yeah, take on Klitschko, man. Do it. Yeah, I think I think I found a, a whole new vocation. I'm gonna have to start training after the show. Kids, man. <laughs> True, faded, faded. It is. Wow. Wow. So, so Manu, while we're talking about stand-up comedians, um, I hear. Um, do a little birdie that uh, that you've tried your hand at stand-up comedy. How's that going for you? I, what little birdie told you that sort of thing? I, I, uh, I, think I you... mean, I... <laughs> the great bird of the galaxy, maybe. You know what? I, I have, uh, you know, around the, the last 10 years or so when I go to the conventions, I'm always uh, on stage doing a little stand-up, making people laugh. But uh, as far as throwing my hat into the, in the regular ring in, in L.A., I, you know, I always, I've always known I could do that and and can do that, but I'm not a, a huge fan of comedy, even though I'm, you know, decent at it. So no, I've never, I've never actually gone that route. I've always, that's like my backup plan. You know, if, if I don't um, make it in movies and television, then I'll go do stand up for a few years and make it that way. But at the moment, no. no I can't recommend that one. The, the money is much better in the movies and TV. Much yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. you know, so, um, do it, man. Write a few jokes, get up on stage. I can do it. 
Yeah, I know you could. I knew you could. Um, I've got so many awesome questions for you. I mean, this is not going to be a boring episode. And uh, I was surprised as I was looking up some of your projects, there was a project that uh, that I'm really interested in um, that I want to get right to as long as we uh, started talking about comedy because this is kind of funny or it has a lot of funny potential. Um, yeah. You've been doing, uh, I think you did a dark comedy called Ben Troubles. Is that it? Yeah, that is at, yeah, the moment, absolutely. The title, at, the, at the moment, the title is Benjamin Troubles, the half a million dollar dark comedy from Kai Efron, uh, who used to be the right hand man as far as um, he was the uh, location manager for all of um, Christopher Nolan's films. And he's broken off and started directing now. And um, I got the lead role in that and then ended up executive producing a couple weeks into the shoot, too, uh, putting in some money. And. Um, it looks like we've got a good movie. We're trying to we're trying to squeeze squeeze the the edit out by the Sundance deadline, which is like the seventh of next month. If we don't make it then, then it's a couple more months. But it's a it's a movie about a kid with magic blue that, that finds a pair of magic blue jeans. This uh, down and out kind of graffiti street painter kid that has the worst day of his life and then gets blessed with a pair of magic blue jeans that create a hundred dollar bill on the hour every hour in the pocket and uh it's sort of a, a a dark comedy romance action guns gangsters sort of like a um a, a softer version of um what's that guy that did snatch and those type of films um uh lock stock oh, and two smoking barrels guy Ritchie, right sort of a guy guy Ritchie type of thing but with romance and a little softer than his films are. A little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely genre bending, but I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I do a lot of um, indie films, and about one out of four of them are uh, have any potential, and this one looks pretty good. It does look really good, and uh, I want to talk about this. I know that uh, um, our uh, my executive officer, uh, Mr. Goodnight, he's got a. A secret Starfleet mission he's got to get to um, fairly soon, but hopefully he can hang with us. And I wanted to get this in before he went, because I know he'd love the, just the idea of this story. I guess uh, some homeless guy um, gives the, gives Ben um, a pair of, uh, of magic jeans. And uh, did, uh, I have a lot of questions. Did the, did the homeless guy actually know that they, they had magic? Well, it, there's a real, there's you know, I think that part of the movie is going to be really kind of up in the air, who this guy is, where he came from, if he's even human, if he's a spirit, if he's just a homeless guy. It's a, oh. There's a sort, of, sort of a supernatural, weird sort of an element going on that people at the end of the movie are going to have to figure the it out. Magic the man. Now, there's, the, the yeah. Duke's that um, knocking off, if you will. It, when he gives the jeans to Ben, he says, don't let these do to me what do to you what they did to me. And then he kind of disappears into the, into the ether. So, um, you know, it's, it's a movie about whether, mo you know, whether money brings you happiness. And um, it's just, it's also kind of like a Coen Brothers movie. I play the main character, Ben, and Ben is usually just, he's just kind of a laid back kid, sort of normal. Mm. But pretty much every character he runs into in the film is a complete whack job. You know, like how the Coen <laughs> Brothers, Coen Brothers like to do that quite a bit. Where they they've got like all the supporting cast are completely strange. Um, wow! I don't know. I think it's, it's gonna be a funny film. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking. looking yeah, watch I'm really looking. Thing. Yeah, Mr. Goodnight. I am really looking forward to this, and I'm sure you could tell uh, Manu here all about the magic in, in your pants. Uh, but we won't get into that. <laughs> well, my pants are always magic. Yeah. Seriously, I, every pair of jeans I wear, whether I get them for $5 at the Goodwill, they're $100 jeans when I'm wearing them, my dungarees. <laughs> well, well. anyway, um, I have a couple questions uh, more about this uh, particular production. Um, like, uh, Manu, if you, if you actually were Ben and you had a chance as Manu, actually, um, as you, who you are right now. Way, oh, is, is, is it Manu? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Don't worry yeah, about it. Like, you say yeah, Manu, I, I say Manu. You say tomato. It's one of those kind of things. I, you know, it's yeah, a right, name. I, I respond to anything relatively close. All right. Well, this is what I'm going to do for myself for mis, uh, mispronouncing your name. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, 
Manu. Um, you can't talk after that. You're yeah, I was going to say, I go to continue the show, that thing was on stun. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm pretty strong, though. I've got, like, these poor, personal force fields, so there's only, you know, 75% you got your own shield. You know, damage. Is that what you're saying? You've got your own shield, your own personal shield. <laughs> yes. Who does yes. it? You're, and when, you're behind the times, man. Go get one. It's like the iPhone 4. Come on. Get your personal oh, I shield. Oh, I've yet to download the shield app, I guess. Yeah, come on. Working. Dave. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> before we get off on a tangent, because I'm not sure how, exactly how much time you have, Madhu, um, yeah. but uh, I, I really got to ask you a couple things. Um, if you had the opportunity to have these magic pants, would you have fallen down that same road, uh, or do you think you would have gotten in bigger trouble, or do you think you would have uh, uh, invested wisely? Would you have waited? Would you have, or just spent every hundred as it came in? How would you have dealt with that? Here's the the, the 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 rules about the magic pants are if you, the rules come in the pocket and the rules are you can't remove them. It's, they, it says do not repair and do not remove. So in order to keep getting that hundred dollar bill every hour, you you can't take the pants off and you can't repair them. So if you ripped your crotch, you'd basically have to go free balling for life. You know. Well, they make it easy <laughs> to go to the bathroom though. Because if you can't yeah. move them, that's going to be some nasty pants. Well, there's some technicalities there, right? So what does remove really mean? Do, does it mean, you know, one leg off at a time is okay, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So I, if I if I had a pair of magic pants, would I get myself in trouble? Back in my early 20s, yeah, I would have partied. <laughs> now, no, I'd do the right thing with the money. <laughs> Wow, that's a great answer. Oh, my gosh. Because that is just, that gets my mind going because I, I would get myself in all kinds of deep doo-doo, and I would not be taking that off. Hey, we have another caller. Let's beam this caller in, too. Hold on a second. All right. Oops, I think he oh, shot the black. caller, dude. <laughs> That's really nice, you know. You get a call and you're blasting with a photon torpedo. I mean, what sort of, what sort of show is this? <laughs> I pressed the wrong button, man. Be real oh nice guy to your guest. Yeah, try not to kill the guest this week, Jeff. <laughs> hey, well, um, we have the pleasure of welcoming a very, very special guest. He's always a special guest. Um, he's the leader of Sci-Fi Pulse, uh, and we are talking with Ian Cullen. How are you, Ian? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, how are you guys? And hello, uh, is it uh, Manu? Yeah, that's me. I'm awful, man. This is just the worst day ever. This is so boring. <laughs> so, so I'm got, kidding. Got, I'm, got, I'm kidding. I've got the name right. It's Manu. Yeah. So Manu. I kept, I kept, I kept thinking of the Muppets. You know, Manu, 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 Manu. No, come on, that's but but um. That's not Manu Manu. Yeah, wasn't that Mark? Yeah, Mark? It's, it's interchangeable. Manu Manu? That was Mark Manu Manu, wasn't it? It's Manu Manu. <laughs> yeah, Mark and Mindy did the... He did Manu Nanu, I think, right? Yeah, Shalom. Yeah. Manu Nanu Nanu. Um, uh, Manu. <laughs> hey, you, you say Manu, Manu, I say Manu. <laughs> Jeff, you should really get yourself a red jumpsuit like Mark had. You'd look slamming in it. Yeah. 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 Um, what, what was that question you asked about magic pants before, Jeff? Uh, well, well, I'll let I'll let uh, Manu answer that. It's uh, it's about a production he's doing um, called Ben Troubles. Is it Benjamin Troubles or just Ben Troubles? Well, right now it's called Benjamin Troubles, but that's the tentative title, and we're thinking of changing it to Ben Troubles just because it's easier. You know, the, we're, it was the whole play on words with Benjamin Troubles. The kid's name's Benjamin. He gets $100 bills. It causes his life in to go to the, you know what I mean? I think it's too smart for people because my in, super intelligent girlfriend didn't even get it. So I think we're just going to go with Ben Trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, okay, well, um, that is but awesome. It's, uh, it's, I am with Yep. But it, it's a movie about magic pants, and he was asking me, um, they're magic pants, and they create a $100 bill on the hour every hour that this kid gets. And uh, I was Jeff asked me if what I would do in real life if, if that happened to me, whether I'd go down a 
bad path and party and blow the money or, or what I'd do with it? That was the question. Oh, cool. Well, if I had magic pants, uh, seven and nine would become seven of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know if you get it that cheap. But they only make twenty four hundred bucks a day. <laughs> I mean, she's worth quite a bit of money. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, you know, have to keep the fans on for a while. Yeah, you know, they, yeah. they'd have to stay on for weeks. You know, and and yeah, then, yeah, then, then 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 I have stinky underwear. <laughs> yeah, that's the rules. That's the that's the rules. But that's how that's how you suffer for money. Or you could just go commando style, regimental, if you will. Well, that's you what have I'd that do. Problem. I'd go commando, and I'd take one leg off at a time, and sort of wash the you know area, and uh, just kind of <laughs> keep clean that way. You really thought this <laughs> out? But is oh, yeah. washing technically repairing? No, no, I, washing my body with one leg out at a time, you know, to stay clean. Oh, okay. Not washing the pants. And is yeah. washing technically repairing? Oh yeah, I thought this out. I'm a method actor, man. When I go into it, I I I, I got to look at every angle. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, <laughs> if if you saw like uh, if you saw like you know take 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 one leg out and that you know if you've been wearing that long, they're going to be standing up on their own. You could probably take you could probably take them off and just jump right back into them. They'd probably just stay standing. <laughs> wow, that's that's a good one though. Too is washing technically repairing. That's Maybe not if you like jumped in in water, because then you're swimming. You're not technically washing, right? Yeah, I guess that would be true. Yeah. Yeah, get, getting really technical nowadays. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like uh, God or the angel or someone in charge of these magic pants needs to uh, needs to create um, uh, you know a rule book or some kind of cheat sheet book for for these pants. Like I mean, this sounds like the greatest American hero here. He he put on a, the super suit and he has no idea how to use it. <laughs> yeah, that's where part of the comedy comes from because the you know the pocket just comes with those two notes: do not repair, do not remove. So he's got to figure out the rest of it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. We have another caller call, call in. Um, wow, uh, it's all chicken scratches here. I have no idea. Let's let's, let's beam this guy in too. Um, Don't you think I know who he is? Try not to show. Hold him on. Time. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna beam him in. Hold up. What's he look like? Hi, Jeff. Mano, can you hear me? Hey, how are you? Hey, we've got Manu, we've got Manu. I can. How are you guys doing? I'm I'm Corey from uh, Reno, Nevada. I'm in your chat room right now, too. I didn't know if you guys were seeing what I was writing or not in there. But... Yeah, thank right you on, for Corey. joining us. Yeah, do you have anything you want to ask Manu? No, yeah, I did, actually. It's uh, Manu, wait, you wait. Jeff Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Manu. <laughs> Shoot yourself again. Yeah, you know, is that how ironic, you know, with this, you know, like I was saying in the room, uh, you know, my brother-in-law wrote books for the Star Trek book series, and his name's Brad Ferguson, so maybe you're a distant relative. Oh, maybe. Uh, my uncle is very deep into the family trees and helping people discover their roots, and mine go way back past the Mayflower, way back with Scottish. <laughs> so you discover their yeah. roots on the family tree. That's a, that's quite a pun you threw in there, did Well, as long as you, you, you know, you, you have the roots that count, you know. But uh, hey, you know, I was going to ask what, when you when you have to do the makeup for these shows, and you know, it's such an extensive uh, production to do that makeup. You know, sometimes when you have such an early casting call too, you know, the next day, uh, do you, is there anything that they do to like keep keep like you keep the makeup on? Like you know, you you guys do a sixteen eighteen hour day, and you got to be back in four or five hours. You know, you're not going to take the time to take that all off. Do they have some kind of thing that you can wear over over the makeup so you don't have to uh, take it all off, put it all back on, or do you just go through that exhaustive process anyway? Well, you know, I only did, you know, each of makeup was pretty simple, just that nose and that eyepiece. But when I when I was bored, um, it was definitely, uh, yeah, on a hellacious schedule. I'd get in at 4.30 in the morning, usually 4 o'clock, and then they'd put on the makeup for three hours. And, and if we had a 12-hour day, 14-hour day, they'd take it off and we'd do it all over again and just get uh, not a whole lot of sleep. I never had to wear it overnight, but I had heard stories on set of people that had had to. I know Picard had to at one point um, go home in the Lucutus outfit back in the day. Um, 
and uh, a friend of, a friend of mine knew his roommate at the, at the time, and I, I met uh, him a, a while back. He didn't tell me the story, so this is a secondhand story, but supposedly his roommate came back, and there's Lucutus with the whole eyepiece and the red the red light and everything sitting in the living room. So, so that could make for an uh, interesting ride home uh, at a stoplight if you had that all on and people wondering what the heck. <laughs> But then again, too, in, in in L.A., maybe it wouldn't be so different, you know, for somebody to see that, you know. Yeah. No, it was it's well before Bluetooth, it. though, so you couldn't just say it was that. I can, <laughs> I can attest to that. But, you know, when you'd leave the lot for lunch, you'd have to leave your makeup on. So if you drove anywhere for lunch, um, it was um, you got some strange looks. Also, just walking around the Paramount lot, you know, um, I think the people that worked there got pretty used to aliens walking around everywhere. But if you were visiting, if you were if you were visiting the lot, it was a strange sight. Oh, I bet. So. And, and then you know, and then to get an itch or something with that stuff, I'm sure it's probably itchy and irritates your face. But having it on for hours and hours at a time, I mean, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you should get hazard pay for some of that it's stuff. A, it, it's a it's a foam rubber latex too, and it and it rots really quick, so it smells like a, a moldy towel, like a mildewy dewy towel. Oh man, that's not good for a date, you know. This. No, no. So, so actually, it, hey, you know, I I, I I know you got other callers and everything. I appreciate the answers. I, I just got a quick one, maybe give you guys a laugh. Um, my my father in law, uh, when my brother in law Brad, one of his books came out, it was. And uh, it was called Crisis on Centaurus. And my father-in-law was really excited, and he went around, he went to the next-door neighbor to tell him, and the lady was kind of, you know, what a real straight-laced lady and everything. And <laughs> my father-in-law was saying, oh, you know, my son Brad had a new, has a new book that just came out. And she goes, oh, really? You know, and he goes, yeah, it's called Crisis on Clitoris. He totally got it wrong. <laughs> And and he didn't realize that he's saying it wrong, so this lady just looks at him and thought he was this perverted, crazy, senile old man, you know, and storms off in a huff. And he comes back in the house, and he's telling her, he goes, man, he goes, her name was Mrs. Pigga, with a great name, too. And he goes, man, Mrs. Pigga got all mad at me when I told her about Brad's new book, you know, and yeah, I don't understand what happened, you know, and we're like, well, well, what the heck, you know, we didn't know either. Like, why would she get all mad? He goes, I don't know. I told her the name of the book, and she got all mad and stormed off. We said, well, what would you say the book was? And he and he said it again, still not getting it, you know. I told her it was called Crisis on Clitoris, and, you know, we all broke out laughing, you know, and then he finally got it and was like, oh, my gosh, you know. And he's all just mortified now. How do you go explain to your neighbor, you know? It would probably make it worse to try to even apologize and tell her, you know, obviously that was not the title. But uh, yeah, anyway, classic. I thought you guys would get a kick out of that. Hey, I appreciate your time and the answer, and uh, thanks a lot for the for the good work and everything. I mean, uh, yeah. exhausting as all that might be, it still makes for exciting to be in that business, and uh, you know, it's all the better for us to enjoy. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Corey. Well, if you dig it, check out Fortress and, and look for Benjamin Troubles. Um, Absolutely. Also, did you did you, uh, did you say Brad Ferguson wrote Star Trek books, your brother? Uh, yeah, my brother-in-law, he wrote uh, a few books for us, the Star Trek book series um, a few years ago. He wrote, like, you know, of course, like Crisis the, uh, on Clitoris and, 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 and he, um, he wrote, Invader uh, uh, for Boner Central and, and what else? <laughs> <laughs> um, he wrote, uh, gosh, I want to, th- I think another one was called uh, Flagship Full of Stars. Um, gosh, you know, I should know this stuff. And uh, another one was something that had the title World or something, and I can't remember now. But if you, if you look them up, just put in Brad Ferguson author or Brad Ferguson Star Trek or something on Google search, you'll see the stuff that he did. And I think at one point he was like a president of some kind of sci-fi uh, convention or, or a group or something like that, too. And, but uh, Have any yeah. of you guys read any of the Star Trek literature, the, the books? Yes. Uh, oh, me? Yes. I'm sorry. A- anybody? Uh, well, uh, not a lot, and, and you know, and, and I hope I hope my brother-in-law is not listening because I've never even read his <laughs> books that he wrote. So, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I want to know I which ones. Have, I want to know which ones have each have been them because people are saying that that's been written. I, I'd like to know what his story, what happened to him. Gosh, you know, I I don't know. Um, I got. I think probably the last book that Brad did was probably in the late '90s, maybe. Mid, right, so mid to I, late 90s, I so I don't know what that time period would be. you know. And I don't know how that all works with the book series compared to the actual series, TV series. you know. So I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know if they cross-reference each other or if they're completely different stories that have nothing to do with you know, the actual 
TV show itself, yeah. so I, I'm not my sure. My character would have been in the womb back then. So, yeah, well, then, well, hey, we'll go right back to the title of it with the wrong title then, I guess, there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll take thanks, my guys. flagship to Clitoris. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Crisis, <laughs> crisis on Clitoris. Yeah, look, Brad Ferguson, Crisis on Clitoris. Yeah, he loves that. But, uh, hey, thanks, you guys, and uh, look that thanks, up if Corey. you want. You know, he'd, he'd get a kick out of it. And, hey, thanks for the great work. You're welcome. All right, Corey, I'm going to beam you out of here. Thank you so All much. Right, thanks, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> I gotta look him up, Brad Ferguson. That's cool. Um, wow, uh, we've got a lot to do, uh, Mr. Goodnight. How much? How much more time do you have? I'm gonna have a few more minutes, Big Data. Okay, well, hang in there because I, I have so many questions from the new work. We we've got so much to go over. Um, and uh, yeah, um, as he was, as Corey was trying to point out, do you have any idea what was supposed to have happened to your character when you got back to Earth? Was there any kind of literature that you read on that? Are you talking to me? Yeah, uh, Madu. Yeah, I, I'm I'm clueless, man. I haven't read any of the Star Trek books. Um, I know there's going to be some interesting answers with this movie, Star Trek Renegades, that the uh, the people from Gods and Ma- Star Trek Gods and Men are making uh, uh, probably a year or so from now. Um, and it's going to take place ten years after Voyager, and Echeb's going to be in it. So we're going to find out something there. Mm-hmm. But I I know nice. that he has made the the novels. Uh, I just, you know, don't know much more than that, so I was curious. Walter Koenig sent me a, his, his private copy, one of his private copies of the DVD uh, of Up Gods and Men, and I just, I love that movie. I love how they had all these actors, and, and Tim Russ. Now, is Tim, Tim Russ going to be directing this one or producing this one? Um, he's yeah. going to be in it again. I don't know whether he's going to produce or not, but so far me, Tim, and Walter are attached to a few other actors. You can go on to Star Trek Renegades, I think, dot com and check it out. It's you know, We're just getting started, but I, I'm pretty excited about it. I think it will be a... Yeah, I think he's directing and, and, and uh, acting in it. Um, I think I think the producing is actually being done by Sky Conway. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not, not too sure. Uh, I know I know a little bit about because uh, Jack Trevino, who's one of the writers, that actually works with a uh, Renegade, and he also works on Love Gods and Men. Um, you know, yeah. he kind of like, told me about it a few weeks back, sort of thing. So, you know, before before it's actually all released, actually on the internet. So, um, yeah, a lot of folks like from that, that team are are uh, are involved. It's basically the same same folks. So, um, and the story is going to be darker and and. Uh, I don't know. I, I loved. I thought Gods and Men was really well done too, especially for the the, the money they had to make that thing. It was pretty genius. Mm-hmm. Oh, Garrett I've got signed on too, so Garrett will be in it too. Cool. I've got a quick question for you, Manu. It's a it's a non Star Trek question. I noticed that you was in the movie J. Edgar, directed by Clint Eastwood, and uh, and starring Leonardo uh, DiCaprio. Oh, sorry, DiCaprio. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering, um, how, how did you actually find working on that movie? Because it's that's probably like one of the biggest things you've worked on um, in regards to a movie, I, I guess. Um, you know, I, I, it was a, a, certainly a pleasure to work with Clint Eastwood and DiCaprio. Um, I, I was only on the film for two days, and we filmed two scenes, and only one line made the film. But those two days were great, man. I mean, um, working with those guys and, and meeting them and uh, seeing how they do their crafts and... Um, both of them were some of the most humble, um, coolest people that that I'd met, which is always nice because in Hollywood, a lot of times you meet your icons and they turn out to be douchebags. And um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Leo and Clint were both very just welcoming and they immediately put you on their level, um, you know, walked right up to you, hey, I'm Leo, what's going on? Let's bang this out today, let's work. Um, it... it Clint Eastwood, even after the end of every take, opens it up to everybody on set, whether you're a gaffer or a grip or anybody. When he finishes his shot, he goes, that's great, I like that. Anybody else have any ideas? And he'll he'll hear out anybody that does. So um, just a, an, an awesome gentleman. Cool. Yeah, I just thought I'd ask you about that, because I'm not sure if Jeff would have asked you about that one. Yeah, um, no, I was, was a, I was getting to that. Yeah, it was yeah, a lot um, of fun. I, had, I mean, they... They had, they, you know, there were four criminals that got busted, uh, famous criminals. I played Alvin Sharpis. And um, there was uh, 
more more scenes for for each of them. There was a little bit more of a storyline in in the original script, but they you know when they edited it, they went they went away from that story and and stayed more just on the the central story. They didn't want to go off on that tangent, so a, a lot of that stuff ended up not in the film. Mm. Okay, so were you or were you not like in the final version? Because I, I can't remember. Oh yeah, I'm in the movie. Um, Leo comes around a white horse. I, I'm walking out of my a hotel with a, my gangster buddy and his girlfriend, and we get into a car. We get surrounded by FBI agents, and Leo pulls me out, and I say, "Off! Oh, if it isn't Mr. Hoover himself, looks like I'm going to be famous, and he cuffs me, and they drag me away, and that's basically, that's basically the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, it, was it fun? Was it oh, it was great, just... man. Yeah, it was great. It was on the back what, line. What about the... Say again? Um, no, no, I was, I'm sorry. There, there is a slight delay. I apologize if, if he, any of us uh, over-talk each other, overlap. Um, there is a slight delay, so sometimes it can be difficult. But, um, yeah, with uh, Clint, I mean, did, did how, what, how, how in-depth was your interaction with him? Was it, And do you think you'll ever work with him again? You know, it's possible. It's a funny story. Um, he, you know, he was, it was like working with your funny uncle, you know, um, he walked over to me when I first got on set, and you know I'm wondering, do I call him Mr. Eastwood? You know, what kind of, what's the protocol? Uh, you know, he walks over and looks at me, you know, stares me down and goes, well, if it isn't Manu, uh, blah blah blah, because um, he <laughs> couldn't pronounce my last name and didn't care to, and uh, but it was funny, you know, and he winked up your shaft and. Uh, he, and he, you know, he'd passed me off tape, so we hadn't met. Um, but during the 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 whole directing of the the, the 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 scene, he was very hands-on. But it's it's funny how he does it. You know, he respects his actors after he hires them because he knows he hired good people. So in the beginning of the scene, he walks over to me and Leo, and we're standing in front of the house where we're the whole bust scene is going to go down. He he has the script. And he says to, to me and Leo, he goes, all right, so you guys are uh, going to come out the door here and uh, you're going to say, uh, you know, whatever you say. And then Leo will be coming down the street from over here and he's going to, you know, say what, whatever he says. And then, uh, you know, the, the guys are going to swarm in on you and then you're going to get pulled out of the car and, you know, say what, whatever you want to say. And uh, you guys got it? <laughs> you know <laughs> he just basically says like you know what you've read the script I trust you go for it he allows you to improv um, and so I immediately improv as much as possible to try to get in the, the movie as much as possible you know and I thought I was in trouble because when the scene was over he, he put down his little viewer that he watches the take on and he did that slow Clint Eastwood cowboy walk over to me with his eyebrow cocked like I was an idiot. And when he got to me, he goes, he stared at me for a while, and I just kind of stared there, sat there thinking I was in trouble, and he goes, I like that. Let's do that. And so then he covered it and shot it from all the different angles. But um, really a cool guy to work with. And, you know, one one time I was eavesdropping on him in a producer's conversation, and the producer was saying they were over budget and they needed to do this or that. And Clint goes, um, yeah, well, if Mr. Carpus here wasn't blowing every take, we, would, we wouldn't have any problems. <laughs> you know, so he was he was just a pleasure and funny and just always r- ribbing on you and just, a, I don't know, funny man, good dude. As long as, long as you don't flip back his poncho and go for the gun, you know, you're all right. Yeah, yeah. And the other day I ran into him in the supermarket and um, we chatted a little bit. This was just like five days ago, so... Um, there's a chance I could work with him again. I'm gonna keep it, keep everything else, play my cards closer to my chest. I hope so. <laughs> That's awesome! Wow, that is so cool. You ran into him in the supermarket. That can only happen in L.A., I guess. <laughs> yeah. Or I Carmel. Carmel. Didn't he live there? Wasn't he the mayor there for a while? In Carmel. Yeah, California. Yeah. Yeah, he was the mayor of Carmel for some time. I think he. I think he lives. He probably lives everywhere. That guy's got a lot of money. From what I remember, he did that as a favor. I think to uh, without even a pair of pants, without even a pair of magic pants, he got all that money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So 
I hear he did that as like a kind of a favor to his associates or whatever. I think they wanted him to run. They kind of, you know, kind of talked him into it because I don't think he's really into politics. But I, I said the minute that he got in office as mayor, I'm like, oh, this guy's got to run for president. No one's going to mess with him. Ronald Reagan will look like a wimp compared to this guy. Well, you, you know, look at this uh, way, the crime up to went down when he became the mayor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I think he'd wow. stand a good chance if he decided to do that. <clears throat> if Schwarzenegger can do it, he sure is good. Oh, good. <laughs> well, all I, can, all, all I can say is it's good to see Schwarzenegger back in the movies again. I just saw The Expendables too, and that was amazing. <laughs> that was yeah. great. Have you have you ever met Arnold Schwarzenegger? Mother? I have. I auditioned for that movie, The Sixth Day. Um, oh. Where he had it, you know, he had his clone, and uh, yeah. I was one of the bad guy assassins that that dies in the uh, in the parking garage in that film. And I made it all the way up to reading, reading for him and the director. The only story I have from that interview is I I have completely I was a young actor at that point and just I went I went overkill. I went you know. First of all, when he came in, he was grabbing some cookies off the tray that was sitting out front. And I was kind of nervous because I was young, and there's Schwarzenegger, and I go, "Oh, hey, hey, man, what, what, what kind of cookies uh, is, is that, are those? Uh, uh, um, <laughs> like, uh, are they uh, oatmeal raisin or something?" He turned to me and he goes, Psst, "Chocolate." <laughs> so much for the Schwarzenegger diet. Yeah, <laughs> and then when I went into the room and read for him, I I climbed. It was a death scene, so there's a bunch of executives sitting around the table, the director and Arnold. And I, in my bright idea, I climbed up onto the business table and died in the middle of the table instead of just reading from the chair. Um, and I think I freaked all these guys out, so I didn't get the part. <laughs> and then Arnold, and then Arnold afterwards, we start talking, and and you know he goes, he goes, Manu, Ente Reme, what, what kind of name is that? And I go, well, what kind of name is Schwarzenegger, man? And so that was. <laughs> and then he went home and cried. Yeah, the meeting didn't go very well. I have at least he didn't, at least he didn't go. At least he didn't go. Fuck you, asshole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> we'll set a corner. I, I have baby. I have an answer for Mr. Schwarzenegger. Manu means. Firstborn of a new kind or lawgiver. I think that's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jeff Ferguson, Professor Wikipedia. And yeah. Schwarzenegger <laughs> means black plowman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm serious, that's what I mean. I think, yeah, that's true because Schwartz means black. Yeah, it's. It's yeah. a black plowman, like a a, a a laborer in the fields is a Schwarzenegger. All right. Well, you, you know what? I forgot to do this to myself for mispronouncing your name a second time. So, um, so I don't pronounce your, your, your lag did it. <laughs> right, right. Now, These don't get around right either. You're in good company, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Manu, uh, so I don't mispronounce your uh, last name. The first time, um, how do you pronounce your last name? Ente Reme. Ente Reme. Ente Reme. Oh. Yeah. And now, uh, now that that South is from South. the Incas, right? Ente Reme. Yeah, it's the Incan. Um, I'm not Incan. I'm Irish. My parents are just huge hippies and gave me my own last name. Uh, you don't see many Incans these days. No. Um, it's always funny for new casting directors that see me, though. It's kind of been a problem throughout my career because my agent will call a new casting director and be like, you've got to see Manu and Reme for this white 28-year-old. And they're like, "I'm not. we're not casting an Indian. We're, we're not. Um, no, no, it's Manu and Reme. It's just a white kid. Just you got to see him. So they, all, they, they never expect me to look like what I sound like. Yeah. And your voice and then did one get deeper. And I, I got to tell you a funny story too. One time, somebody stole my my um, my phone card and charged like eighteen hundred dollars on it to phone calls to India, and I tried to fight it. So I called the the company and I was like, "Look, I didn't make any phone calls to India. I don't know anyone in India." And they were like, "Yeah, right, Manu and Tiremi. <laughs> sure, you don't." <laughs> like, no, I'm a white guy. I actually eat chib. 
<laughs> yeah. I still owe that money, according to them. Wow. Wow. That 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 stinks, man. I wouldn't pay it. Um, no, I, I would say no way. Yeah, again, no, just yeah. a little bit of magic pants come in really handy. Yeah. I, <laughs> I um, actually have all the magic pants from the movie. I have like five pairs of them, so I'm, I'm doing good. Uh, did you, were you able to keep at least one of them? Would I ever what? Um, was that you, Ian? Did you ask a question? Because I asked, um, did, you, did you get to uh, actually keep one of the pairs of those magic jeans for nostalgia, or, or did they just keep all the the, the uh, props? I actually took all of them. No kidding. Now, what about, what about the e chat? What about did the you get e-chan paid in uh, dance to do the movie? Did you get yeah. paid in dungarees? I got paid, yeah, I got paid in, in, in unlimited blue jeans. Um, That's what they do in the indies. Yeah. <laughs> Now did, they, uh, did, uh, did, now, did you hate the uh, did you hate the Echeb sweater that you first had to wear? I mean, uh, or did you like it? What was that? What was your feelings on the on the clothes you had to wear? You know, because um, I I you thought know, you would have looked, looked really cool in leather or something, man. You know, something really cool. I but, didn't uh, so much mind the Echeb wardrobe. I thought it was all right. Uh, um, hmm. The 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 one thing I didn't like was when I was a Borg. It, the the design, you know the. The idea was that I wasn't fully maturated, so the costume designer decided to make me full Borg everywhere except for my right leg up to the crotch, and I just had a skinny white leg. And if you <laughs> and, and arm and if yeah, an arm. And if you if you look at that, you know, I, I demanded that they at least give me pantyhose because I've got these horrible white Irish legs. Um, <laughs> and I, I just so a I good pair of Indian legs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were. I felt like, you know, um, I didn't feel like you've got that whole costume on, and, and I, I wanted to feel strong and Borg and robot-like, and then I had to keep looking at my dorky leg walking around. So in every shot, I tried to hide that as much as possible. But you can see so that was, the, of course, the episode Collective, right? Your very first episode called Collective? Yeah, that was the one. Yeah. I just watched that today with my daughter. My son, they love it. My daughter says, uh, my daughter wants to say hi real quick. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, her name is Ariel. She's beautiful. And uh, she saw you today in the episode Collective. So say hello to uh, Manu. Hi, Manu. Hi, Manu. Hi. Hi, Ariel. That's a beautiful name. I love you in Collective. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, have you seen some of the other ones where I'm not so green? Child play. Have you seen any of the Echeb episodes? Ch- child's play um, with with my dad and my mom. And, uh, wait, 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 wait. It's about it's about Egypt's parents. Yeah, child's play. Cool. I'm glad you've seen some other stuff. And thank you. Okay. I love you. I watch it all. Oh, she's nervous. I'm sorry about that. But uh, I don't think I right. get your name right. She did. <laughs> yeah, she got she, she got your name right. Yeah, she's but, smart uh, as a whip. <laughs> She's she's a, just a chip off the old block. She's she's really sweet. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we'll, we'll be watching the rest of uh, the sixth and seventh uh, seasons of Voyager with all your episodes on there. And uh, I wanted to know, um, as long as we're talking about Voyager now, I, of course I have all kinds of questions. I didn't want to bore you at first. Uh, with oh, this, Jimmy, if we're going to Voyager, though, I, I hate to just let him just for a moment, but I'm afraid I got to beam down right now. I got I got to. Special secret Jeff Trek mission. I gotta go solve the crisis on Clitora somewhere, so I gotta beam out and I'll be at it. Uh, where do you want to beam down? Well, uh, to Clitora, of course, right at the the G spot. Right, at the G <laughs> spot. Mi- yeah, if you can find it, you know, if you can find it. Okay, I'm gonna beam you down to the G spot right now. Um, is now is this in LA? I gotta set the proper coordinates, or is this in Boston? 
Uh, I don't think anybody really knows where the G where the G spot is. Ask Doctor Stefan Grafenberg, or whatever his name was. <laughs> oh God, my ex-wife, you know. Yeah, my ex-wife knew I found that G spot, and she's keeping it a big secret because, you know, I'm the big mistake. But uh, anyway, let me beam you down, and uh, thank you for joining us once more. Uh, oh yeah, you what are you, Jeff? Goodbye, Manu. Goodbye, Ian. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good night. All right. Have a good night. Live long and prosper, that is. I'm telling you guys, he is just one of my best friends ever, and he is sharp as a tack. I mean, he knows so... He could have been working for NASA. You know, that guy is just super intelligent. We haven't even scratched the surface with him. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, he's great. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about Star Trek Voyager, because... Um, there is, and by the way, before we even get into that, there is a, a young lady, very charming young lady from Germany, who uh, wanted me to pass on a message to you because it's too late. It's past her bedtime. <laughs> All right. And uh, yeah, she's she's a cutie, you know. Um, she's a 16 year old girl um, who is totally, totally in love with you. Um, her name is Michelle Parada. Uh, does that ring a bell? Michelle Parada? Yeah, Michelle you've got, Parada. You've got, you've, got, you've got things a little messed up, I think. Michelle Parada is a friend of mine and also the actress in Benjamin Troubles, and she's Latin and certainly not from Oh, it's, it's not <laughs> Michelle Parada. It's a different Michelle. I'm sorry. I got my Michelles mixed up. I'm doing just wonderful with people's names here. Um, <laughs> I have, it's, it's Michelle, uh, I'm sorry, Michelle Berard. <laughs> Excuse me, she's going to listen to the archive. Michelle Berard, I am so sorry. I got you mixed up. Hey, but if I'm going to get you mixed up with someone, how about, you know, you know, a co-actor in, in, in a really cool movie like Ben Trouble? <laughs> Why not? Well, yeah. I don't but know the, if you can pass it back on, but Michelle is a little sweetheart. She's, uh, she, I've met that girl at FedCon, um, a convention that is in Cologne, Germany. Um, that a friend of mine, Dirk, runs, and um, yeah, she's she's fun. So nice to hear. It, it, I, I bet Cologne, Germany, smells good too. You know, <laughs> it does. It's All right, Ben. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, hey Michelle, um, we know you're listening to the archives, and uh, you told all your friends. She wanted a pass on uh, this message to you. I love you, Manu. I love you so much. Big smoky. Although I'm sure she'll uh, <laughs> she do it. Is that real? Sweeter, that's the probably. message, really. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the message. Let's she wants to give you smoochie. Tell her, tell her oh. thank you very much. Sm- smoochie back. Yeah. Smoochie yeah. back, that's it. And Okay, and uh, Michelle, smoochy back at you. <laughs> wow, wow. Guys, get it on. <laughs> but, uh, no, she's she's actually a sweetheart. She's a young girl who loves Star Trek, She and she obviously loves you, Manu, so I'm sure she'll be seeing everything that you do um, in the movies. Yeah, she's, she's, a, she's a cool girl. She's uh, Actually, we're friends on Facebook. I know exactly who you're talking about, so that's very, very sweet of her. Well, sweet dreams of her. She's sleeping right now like a baby. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so um, back to Star Trek Voyager. Um, that was one of my favorite shows. Now, people ask me all the time, Manu, um, what is my favorite Star Trek series? And um, I keep telling them, oh, I can't choose between my babies. Oh, my God. Manu, I, lo- I love Star Trek so so much that I just can't get enough of it. There's not one episode that I can't watch again and again and again. Um, not one series I can pick over the others because um, there's, there's reasons why I love certain series and uh, and and they're strong. And uh, Voyager, though, if I had to, if someone put a gun to my head and say, "Hey, what was your your at least your favorite theme song?" I would think it would have to be Voyagers. And, okay, uh, well, and I think that yeah. I just um, said, okay, boy, think, this is the best song. Yeah, it is definitely the best uh, intro song. And uh, and uh, and uh, as far as your character, Echep, you must have felt a little bit like Will Wheaton um, as Wesley Crusher because you were like a, a young guy on, on a starship. Did you did you feel that kind of connection? Do you know Will Wheaton? Have you, you must have seen him at the conventions and stuff. 
Well, I've met Will a couple times since I got off the show. I didn't I didn't know him uh, beforehand, and the characters are are not very similar. But um, I've heard that before. That yeah, I was the Will Wheaton of Voyager. Um, Just because you were young. So. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't know what to say to that. I, Will's a great guy. Um, uh, I know him and his wife, and and the, they're both awesome people. Um, but you know, I actually haven't seen a. I, I'd seen all the films, uh, the the Star Trek films, but I haven't seen a whole lot of of the Star Trek: The Next Generation series. I've kind of episodes here and there. Kind of the same thing with all the series, and I don't think I could choose a best series either. Although. The episodes that I've seen of Deep Space Nine were really, really well written, and I think that 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 series had the best crew of acting talent. Um, mm-hmm. I think that, that the act, uh, yeah, the actors on that show were just inc- incredible, uh, incredibly good. Um, and then uh, you know, of course, I enjoyed Voyager, and and the, the we were pretty damn good too. But um. Uh, I could kick out Enterprise. No offense to anybody on the show, but I, I, you know, I tried to get into Enterprise because I felt it was my duty as a, you know, Star Trek alum to watch the next show, and I couldn't get into it. Yeah, so I heard that. I was going to ask you that. that. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you to get into it. I know Ian has a question for you. Uh, hold on, Ian, just one second. I was going to ask you as you were doing Voyager, and you probably found out uh, to the great find that Enterprise was coming out. Did you try? Did you did you get your agent to try to get you a spot on on Enterprise at least as a guest? Well, actually, back when I was doing Voyager, we were hearing all sorts of stuff through the grapevine, and I heard that the next idea for the show was possibly a show called Academy, and that they yep. were going to do a show about uh, you know a school and you know the away missions from the school and and blah blah blah, and you could have characters from different different series, working at the school. There's all sorts of possibilities. And a lot of the people on the crew kept hinting to me that a contract was coming my way for that show. didn't happen, um, and that's all right. But that's really all I had heard. I didn't I didn't hear that Enterprise was, was uh, the other idea. Um, oh, all right. Um, but, definitely on that thought, on, on that thought, um, now once Enterprise did come out, it did run for four years, did you try... To get a part, or were you not interested, or or what was what was the deal there? No, I'm all I'm always interested. I mean, I guess back then, you know, I was 21, and um, you know, th- these days I would have made friends with the showrunner, and I would have had made closer c- connections with the you know the the top dogs over there, and and kept in contact. Um, but at the time, I was just kind of a, a spoiled kid, you know, so I didn't um, didn't have the ability afterwards to make those phone calls to, to try to come back. Um, but, of course, I'd, I'd always be interested. Um, I, uh, Trek is an amazing show, and uh, anytime anybody uh, that, that's producing, a, I'd love to be on the new one, um, if ABC or CBS or whoever owns it gets around to it. Um, I think Brandon and Rick Berman probably still own a piece. Um, I, I, I'd love to audition and play a different role or the same role, whatever. Um, how could you say no to you know going to work on a spaceship every day? No, oh, nah, you know I, I, can, I can actually I can actually see that right now. You know, just get your character from Fortress and make him captain of a starship <laughs> <laughs> with, yeah. with his own steel. <laughs> Charlie was pretty gritty, wasn't he? Uh, I, I, I like Charlie. I like Charlie. Uh, or like. Uh, it reminded me of um, of quite quite a few 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 people that I've known on and off. I mean, um, you know, I'm 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 of Irish descent as well. Um, you know, my uh, most of my family um, actually go from from Dublin, and uh-huh. uh, my my father was the only one out of um, out of thirteen other siblings. I was actually born here in England. Um, all my all my aunts and uncles on my father's side are all from Dublin. So I've met quite a few characters. So you burn in the sun in five minutes too. Um. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I have. Am, horrible... I'm so Irish, you know, that I, I have to hide from the sunshine. I I actually was thinking about bears the other the other day, and bears they they eat a bunch of food and then they hibernate through the winter. And I thought that was so genius. I I needed to figure out. I'm going to be the first human. I dedicated it. Next year, I'm going to. Get fat and sleep through the summer, so I don't have to see the sun. 
<laughs> genius. <laughs> I, I did notice. I did notice that uh, that uh, that each chef didn't have any sunspots, and then I see you in this movie, and you had a lot of sunspots. You had a lot of freckles and stuff. Oh yeah. So, I don't know if they. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they they covered yeah. them up quite a bit in Star Trek, but um, yeah, they let they let me go in in, in Fortress. <laughs> uh, Big cousin in the chat room wants to know if uh, if you had to wear one shoe and one boot, which I don't know what that means. Oh, say that again. Yeah. If I had to wear what? I think at each end, he's trying to ask you if you had to wear one shoe and one boot. Um, I just wanted to say that because he's a great, great guy. He's a big Star Trek fan. Because uh, you're gonna have to get back in the chat room, and uh, well, he's in the chat room. But uh, uh, give us another statement. Let's let's find out what you're trying to ask there. Um, as far as Fortress is concerned, I love that character Charlie. I loved it that that you were like now you were a medic in that right. A what? Were you a, me- were you a medic? Uh, were you like like the, the plane's medic? I, I noticed that you were yeah, attending he was, to he the... Was, he was the medic and he was the, um, uh, what's it called, the uh, radio operator. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. So um, anyway, I, I also he was also the bartender. Obviously, he was in charge of uh, making the moonshine, right? <laughs> yeah, and in charge of distilling the hooch for the rest of the, the, the crew. That yeah, is so I awesome. See, uh... that- I actually, uh, I actually know where there's a local still near where I am uh, that 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 does pasheen. <laughs> so which is kind of like which is kind of like Irish. It's like surgical bloody spirit. It's it's me for. But I actually know somebody who lives around here where I am. Um, who, who who actually sort of like uh, distills and and, and uh, flogs it in big bottles and so it's lethal stuff. Yeah, that's uh, you know we're, we're Irish. We're born with uh, alcohol in our blood. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I had a real joy playing Charlie because, you know, I'm a little older these days, but I still have that this young face. And, and finally, it was the first time in my life that I got to play like a man, you know? Mm-hmm. I'd been playing a lot of boys and 25-year-olds, 28-year-old kids, and blah, blah, blah. And it was the first time I got to like, you know, look a little filthy and get a beard going and get my hair scraggly and, you know, play a soldier. So that that was, I don't know, it was pretty fun. Yeah. I, I thought it was quite fun fun from from the point of view of someone, you know, because I've, I've only really seen you in Voyager. Um, I, I kind of skipped One Tree Hill, and I kind of remember you in, I, I even remember you in Pearl Harbor waving your arms around screaming, P-41, P-41. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, it's, you know, it was kind of funny seeing you because, so like, um, each head was kind of like a uh, very well mannered, very well behaved uh, young boy, and yeah. uh, and then then we then we have Charlie, so I'm like the complete opposite. I thought, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm. I think my my personality is a, a lot more like Charlie's. Um, it, it sort of stuns folks at conventions, uh, at, at least in the early years, because you know. Um, I've got a dirty mouth too, you know. I'm like, um, anybody, any of you guys ever talked to Jerry Doyle? Uh, yeah, I, I interviewed Jerry Doyle not, not so long ago. You know, I kind of have his attitude. I kind of we share a lot of the same attitude uh, on uh, vocabulary. I, you know, a lot of four letter words come out of my mouth. So when I get up on stage and people are expecting to meet each of they, they're in for a, quite a shock. <laughs> yeah, so they're, 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 they're pretty fucking surprised, huh? Let's say again? They're pretty fucking surprised, eh? Yeah, they are, they are. <laughs> fucking ass. <laughs> yeah. And actually, that is that... all over, you know, on the internet, I get, you know, people, people have complained and just dissed, you know, like, I thought I was going to go, and he's just the worst person, and blah blah blah, you know. Cause, and and I think it's because you know they expect to, in a certain sense, some some folks expect to see the the character they saw on TV, and I'm 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 not I'm not each it. Oh hey hey, I think your phone's cutting in and out. Um, you may have to um, plug it in or something. Is your battery going dead? I hope not, because I still have the questions. <laughs> Am I still going in and out? Yes. Oh, I could, I could hear you say that. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, anyway, I want to say hello to Zeke in the chat room and uh, uh, and Big Cuz again. Uh, I don't know uh, what he was trying to ask about that shoe and boot, but I did ask him in the chat room to 
uh, to go over that. Who cares? Anyway, um, we are talking about uh, um, uh, Fortress, and uh, my favorite scene was when uh, there was two scenes uh, uh, that I liked. Um, the one where I found out that he was making the moonshine and that he was the uh, the crew's bartender, and then when when, when it blew up uh, during an attack, um, he was forced to steal um, seven bottles of Scotch whiskey from the officer's lounge or something like that. Uh, and uh, he got caught. And uh, his character's, uh, what do you call it, his character's uh, uh, commanding officer actually came to his rescue. And at this point, people, uh, people, uh, the, the crew were, were just realizing how important um, that Charlie was. Because at first, they, they didn't respect him, and I guess. And uh, I guess this is a way of, you know, he, he could earn their respect. So he stole this, this, this whiskey, and so this commanding officer came in. And oh, actually, I'm not talking about the uh, uh, Charlie's character. Um, the, I guess I guess the whole crew was trying to gain respect for uh, the lead the character, new pilot. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The new pilot. So, uh, so, but, uh, but he came to the rescue of uh, of the guy everybody loved in the crew, and uh, for, you know, for you know, he stole the booze, he got caught, he was about to get court-martialed, and then he said they needed these bottles as solvent to fix the plane so they can get up there and finish their mission. And uh, they got away with it. And that was my favorite part of the movie. And I could see your mischievous part of your character as Manu, as well as Charlie's character. I'm like, this is the perfect role for Manu. And uh, and yeah, uh, anyway, yeah. that was that, my- that was that was definitely my kind of my kind of scene. Um, that scene was cute too. I thought that scene was great. Um, and I got to work with John Laughlin. Um, was the guy that played uh, the old man, the, the leader of the base. And uh, just the undertones of that scene are, are pretty funny. I was I was happy with that work, and um, also just working with him made my Kevin Bacon number two. So that was pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, so what about John, John Laughlin worked with with Kevin Bacon and Footloose. So if uh, so, oh. I know I, my Kevin Bacon oh. number is now right up there. Yeah, yeah. Another film that we made recently, Footloose. Huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't see the remake. Oh. Oh. Um, yeah, neither did I. I'm scared. Yeah, I don't think I want to either. I, you know, I, I've not bothered either. Yeah. I've seen the trailer. Yeah. What was it like uh, working with director Mike Phillips on that on that Fortress film? Mike yeah. Phillips is awesome, man. I'm I'm uh, hoping to work with him again. Um, sharp as attack. Uh, you know, knows his 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 details inside and out. They they used all real, um, real. All the props were actually authentic World War II uh, stuff. The parachutes, the the outfits, the stuff we wore in the air, the canteens, all of it. Um, and uh, it, just this whole crew of, of people were really good. It was produced by uh, some, you know, the team that did dog fights and um, some of those History Channel shows like Patton 360. And Mike Phillips used to work for the makeup artist back way back in the day on on the Star Trek. Um, we didn't know each other then, but um, he's making a new movie called Night Flyers, uh, which is a World War II film um, that he's raising money for, and I'm I'm hoping to work with him again on that on that one about. But it's this one's about fighter pilots and not not B-17s. I've noticed right. something I, actually. I, um, Sorry, I, I've noticed something no, that, um, you know, I noticed that Fortress, it's only really come out in, in America this year, right? Uh, yeah, it took until, gee, just a couple of months ago for it finally to get released here. Yeah, well, I, I've, actually had it, I've actually had it for about the last two years on DVD. <laughs> yeah, it came out in Australia, and it came out in the theaters in Germany and England and France, like way, way before it ever got here. I, I don't understand why they did that, but that's how it went. Yeah, and I in England, the, uh, in England, they had, and they actually re-released it. They re- they released it once, and then it was off the shelves, and then a year later they released it again. I I, I don't know how those distribu- distribution companies work, but yeah. well, I got a I got a first edition uh, copy because I I remember. Um, you was actually on a um, Roger Noriega's show a couple of years ago, and um, I was on that. You were talking about Fortress, and, and a few months later, I sort of seen it out come out on DVD, and I thought, oh, that's a film. I'll pick it up. 
because I'm kind of into uh, World War Two, you know, movies based, but you know, based in the Second World War. You know, yeah. especially about flyers and bomber pilots and um, and, and aviators. You know, yeah, and the cool like thing about Fortress, you know, the cool thing about Fortress is everything that happens in the air in that film is all based on actual stuff that happened. Is all taken straight from actual reports of of, of fighting. So. You know the the stuff on the ground and the, the crew and all that stuff is fiction. But any time the battle and any battles in the sky that took place is that's how they went down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now is it true? Now is it true that uh, um, there were like a whole squadron of these B twos that were up there? And back then that was new technology, and um, they were constantly running into mechanical problems. Um, and, and 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 the mechanics. Are constantly uh, under so much pressure to get these things fixed in an air shape, and uh, and uh, um, uh, my 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 question is is like I, I guess um, I'm under the impression that only uh, two two planes uh, made all 24 missions over Italy, and uh, one of them was uh, the plane that. Now, what was the, was was the name of the plane called Fortress? Is that why they named the movie Fortress? No, yeah. but the the B seventeen plane is, was referred to as a, the Flying Fortress. So that's that's. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. What was the name of the plane? First of all, because I have another. The, question. Name, the name of the plane was the Lucky Last. The Lucky Last. That's right. Mm-hmm. The Lucky Last. Um, and the Lucky Last, because uh, an Irish plane, she's a. Uh, she has discriminating taste, uh, the commander said, and then he asked for a bottle of the whiskey. Um, no, but my question is, um, there was a lot of planes that didn't complete all their missions. Only two planes completed their mission. Was it the Lucky Lass? And and forgive me if I'm getting this wrong. The Memphis Bell, because I know, uh, if, I don't know if the Memphis Bell well, was on that. Yeah. You know, I don't know the accuracy of of, of either of those. I, I don't know if the Lucky Last was actually a real plane. I don't know if the Memphis Bell was either. And I, I yeah, know Memphis that, Bell was real. It was okay. Yeah. And I know Memphis that the Bell Lucky Last certainly didn't make it because you saw it go down at the end of that movie. <laughs> uh, could have been the last mission. Yeah. It could have been, but it wouldn't have made it with it. Oh, well, okay. I guess, guess it would have. It dropped its bombs, etc. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. I know that it, not a whole lot of those planes did make, all, you know, all all the missions, and it was. I think uh, it was supposed to be twenty four. I think it was supposed to be twenty four missions that they did. Uh, Ian, you may be able to clear this up. I know you wanted to say something about that. Yeah, I think think you're right, Jeff. I think it was twenty four missions. And only two of those two of those B seventeen bombers completed all 24 missions, because they were getting shot down by all the German 109s, and I'm surprised they didn't have a scene with you after Pearl Harbor, so that where you're shouting inside the uh, the last, you're like, oh, German 109, German 109! <laughs> dude, dude, that, that, that would have been historically incorrect, because it was Japanese that bombed Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm saying. Because he's in the water. It was an incredible anyway, experience, though. I mean, you know, they, they built the, the the they they built a you know an entire plane, uh, an entire replica uh, inside of, of what the B seventeen looked like, and they even had uh, a lot of the parts were you know authentic parts. And I think there's only two of those planes in existence that still fly. I know when Memphis Bell was made, there were seven of them, but uh, I don't think there's a, a whole lot. I think there's I think there's just two that can that are still you know, airworthy, um, but incredible aircraft, you know, it, as many as went down, these things were capable of losing three engines and landing gear and getting shot up and still, you know, running on fumes. And it, there was actually a, a report of this one plane that its tail was like almost hanging off and it took like eight crew to like hold the tail on the plane and this wow. thing still made it back. There's all these incredible stories and you can see the plane, there's, if you just look up some, you know, just Google B-17s and World War II, and you'll see all this incredible stuff about just how these things could fly incredibly damaged, you know. Did you fly? Uh, Did you fly in a B-17? Like, uh, I, it wasn't like uh, it wasn't like Top Gun or anything. You didn't get into a real B-17, right? I wish, you know. I wish. 
Wow. And, you know, Night Flyers and stuff, this new movie that he's making, too, about these, you know, the, the I, I, how awesome would that be? I, speaking of Doyle, I was just talking to him the other day, and that lucky guy, man, he's got to get a little bit of time in those F-15s, and what, a, what an amazing rush that would be. Yeah, well, I just wanted to um, uh, just wanted to point out the um, some of the great actors that that shared uh, that opportunity with you. The Bug Hall, Donnie, uh, Jeff Coat, and by the way, the last name Jeff Coat has a real awesome ring to it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, Sean uh, McGowan's Archie. You know what I mean? That was just uh, uh, I watched Sean that. Was great. And I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm and, and and the acting was great, um, and uh, and and it should have been a huge, huge box office blockbuster. Um, and I'm sure it did well in, in it, in it, in whatever, you know, at whatever level it was at, because um, and and it's still making money. Um, did it, it didn't yeah, go it right did, to it DVD. It did really well. It, it you know it it well it was in theaters in Germany. Um, and I don't know. I think there was maybe another European territory that it came out in theaters. It actually came out in. DVD, uh, 3D in theaters in Germany. Um, oh, that's but, awesome! Germany is yeah. awesome. They they are a huge support for not just Star Trek, but for 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 really good stuff. Um, that's just, and it's uh, funny that they love the World War II films. You know, they're, they're they love them. Um, you and know, they're the bad the only... guys. Well, n- <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that's what cracks me up. But like any any World War II film, they just they love they love watching it. They're huge fans. Yeah. Well, um, well, that was great. I really enjoyed that movie. I'm, and one last thing about uh, Fortress, I really loved the, the beginning and all the scenes that had. They showed the tail of, of the planes as they were flying through in a huge fleet, and then it looked so real. And and yeah. and, 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 and and just the gunners underneath, you know, and, and everything, and the and the way that they just they were shooting backwards. I mean, it was like Star Wars of. Of, of World War Two, it was just really. It didn't. I don't think that 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 movie got enough uh, got enough exposure. And I read somewhere on IMDb um, that the budget was like a, a mere two hundred thousand. That's got to be crap. That that can't be true. Well, yeah, it that, is. They have it, a, here's the way. Here's the way they pulled it off. Is is the the team that made it were also the guys that did the CGI. So basically, a team of four to six. CGI guys worked for almost three years to put all those CGI shots in themselves, whereas normally you'd pay five to seven thousand a shot for each one of those special effects shots. These guys knew how to do it, so they did it themselves, and that's how they saved all that money. Wow! Wow! So this, um, and, so this came out in 2012. So you're talking uh, 11, 10. This, you you started production in about 2009. Something? Yeah, I think we shot late 2009. Wow, wow, uh, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, it, it was right, well, quite a quite a quite a feat that they, they they accomplished. Also, the you know all the the the, the desert camp, um, you know, was was actually just a farm. We were in like the middle of this guy's farm where he kept his horses. They just built a bunch of tents and then they put green screen all the way around, and you know, drew in the desert. Um, so I don't know. I think the the movie has like 1,800 uh, special effects shots compared to 500 shots without special effects. And normally movies like that, I I'm that might even be a record. I don't know. I know Star Wars was loaded with that stuff, but. Normally, I don't like movies like that because I don't much like CGI. But I thought Fortress did a really good job of of, of the CGI work. Well, you need that there's to describe a, a couple what's of on paper, right? Say again. Just, you need that to describe what's on paper. I mean, CGI. This is not Star Wars futuristic fantasy stuff. You have to recreate. It's almost impossible to recreate some of these amazing air battles. Like there's some maneuvers that could never be made again. You know, it's like that movie Red Tails. You know, um, it's it's like there's maneuvers that were made that can never be made again, and and uh, yeah. uh, same things guy. that happen. Same guys. The, yeah. the guy that did the special effects for Red Tails is the same guy that did Fortress. Cool. Ian, do you have do you have any last questions uh, on Fortress? Because I I need to skip 
skip to a couple other things too. Um, I got so many questions I haven't gotten to yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be honest, can't, I can't really think of anything else uh, off the top of my head for Bob. Just to be honest. Um, so uh, right. you know, just move on, Jeff. You know, I think. All right. All right. Well, we 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 talked a lot of. Uh, we didn't get too deep into One Tree Hill. I don't know if there's. Uh, too much to say about that. I know, I know that you you want to talk about it, but you also said you want to talk a little bit about pieces. What is what is that? I couldn't find any reference to that. Well, what I'm pretty pieces? excited about it. Um, I just formed the the company to produce pieces. Pieces is a, a thriller about seven kids that hike into the mountains to celebrate a wedding reception, and they run into someone shooting at them, hunting them with a long range rifle, and they have to get 30 miles back to their car from the middle of the 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 deep, deep forest. And um, it's, you know, we've seen this, we've seen that type of movie before. It's not like a, a new thing. But when I read the script, um, it's just such a good script. And it's not your typical, you know, one by one, everybody dies and then the girl gets away or the guy and the girl get away. Um, not a whole lot of people die. And it's 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 more about this crew of kids and their history and how they band together to outsmart and get away from this this horrible situation, and um, we've raised a quarter of the budget, and we're looking to raise the rest. Um, we're looking to shoot in February of next year, and uh, so far it's starring me. We're going out to a lot of main actors. Um, there's a possible, you know, this isn't nobody's locked, but there's a possibility that Eric Roberts might play a role, um, Nick Stahl might play a role. Um, I'm trying to get my buddy Shane West to do it. Um, he's real busy, but we're gonna we're gonna make a, a, a an amazing little film. Um, and it, it's by the director Marcin Tirado, who just directed a movie called Closure that was at Sundance last year. And uh, that's pieces. And also, uh, we're doing a kind of a cool thing with. Um, I've been painting with my girlfriend uh, for the last few. There years. we go. And we started a, a company called FBA Collective. Uh, if you go to fbacollective.com or if you go to FBA Collective on Facebook, all the prints that we're selling of, of my artwork um, or original pieces, if, if you would, if people want to buy those too, all the funds are going to go to, to raising that movie. And I'm doing kind of an interesting thing where if you buy an original piece, I'm going to put a, a special thank you in the credits on, on the end of the film. Um, so it's already been, you know, some Star Trek fan base from different conventions, you know, uh, I've been given 10 grand here to 10 grand there, um, fans have invested. So it's going to be kind of cool that that movie and another film that I'm working on called the fifth passenger, which is a sci-fi film will be. I'm partially... sorry, say that one more time. What, what, what's the name of that? Pacific what? The fifth passenger. This is also oh, the something you want you yeah, you won't see it on IMDb yet, but uh, most likely that's going to be me, Ethan Phillips, Tim Russ, and we haven't found the lead girl yet. Um, we're looking to go for somebody big, you know. Um, but these are, you know, I just started dipping my toe into the producing game with Benjamin Troubles, um, and uh, so those those are the films that are coming next. And uh, right, it's going to so be kind of neat. You have a name, you know, Oh, I'm so sorry. Because of the delay, That's I keep right. cutting you off. But, That's but right. um, do you have a, what is what is the name of your uh, your 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 production company? Cartoful Films. Okay. And is there a website for that that the people can go the, to our listeners? There isn't yet, you know. Uh, the LLC was formed uh, a month ago. We started raising money for pieces two months before that, um, and we're already a quarter of the way to the budget. So people have been uh, uh, very generous, and um, it's really exciting to, to to have the support out there um, for these projects. So I'm I'm pretty pretty happy about it. Wow. And Cartoful, I don't know why we went with Cartoful because we're weird guys. Um, Cartoful means potato in German. Uh, it's also a game of skill where you connect a bunch of little dots together without drawing over the line. Um, right, right, right now we're designing the you know the logo that comes up before the film, and it's it's like a line that like jigs and jigs and jags and goes from potato to potato, over to this little potato wearing a superhero cape holding a movie camera, and he goes movies. How do you how do you spell that? That's hilarious. How do you spell the, uh, that production? Cartoful Films, 
LLC. It's uh, K-A-R-T-O-F-E-L Films, LLC. Beautiful. Uh, well, I wish you all the luck with that. Cause that's, I produce a local access TV show, which is, you know, it's all volunteer. Uh, I've got a lot of the local comedians joining in with me, um, and, you know, and uh, I uh, it's going through some changes right now. I want to start doing some stories instead of just doing, like, a late-night format and joking around and stuff. But uh, I did want to get you on Jeff TV at some point uh, as it's uh, evolving, and uh, it's going to be more of a production company, uh, more so than an actual TV show um, as it evolves. So I, I cool. look at you, and I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do. I look at, you know, Manu, and, uh, man, I have so much admiration for you. Um, and uh, and I've got, like, eight years on you. And, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm like your elder. So well, I'm thank like, you, brother. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heavy workload, man. But, you know, if you've got the passion for it, you, that's all you can do, right? Eh? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I'll do exactly whatever I can do. And uh, I wanted to jump back really quick to um, to Voyager because um, my favorite Voyager episode, uh, I have two of them, um, or technically three. I, I, my favorite Voyager episodes were the last ones, like, like the last two, like when they get home. After, you know, and I, I, you know, call me sentimental, I don't care. But if I had to, like, pick another one, other than that, Manu, I would pick um, Q2. I love that episode. Q2 um, is fun. Yeah. Yeah, that was with... Uh, uh, now, Keegan Delancey played... Uh, who was the son of John Delancey, who played Q. He played the young Q. He played his son. Um, now, now, uh, what was... Now, what was it... I don't want to ask you what was it like, but uh, did you stay friends with him um, after that? Have you Have you seen him at conventions... Um, have you acted with him other than that episode? Or you know, um, Keegan Keegan stopped acting from from what I know. I haven't seen him in a long time. Um, but you know, pretty much all the actors on Star Trek end up getting to know one another, one another, even on the separate shows from the different conventions that we do every year. Um, so we're all you know buddies or at least acquaintances, um, and we all get along, and, you know, we might not see each other for a year or two or three, but, you know, when, when we reconnect, we hang out, and, you know, I, I, I saw Keegan for maybe a year afterwards at a few different shows, one in uh, Blackpool, England, and uh, he's an awesome kid, but I think what he's doing now is he's a diplomat. I think he's a foreign diplomat um, for I don't know what, but... Um, Super genius uh, doing a hardcore government job is, is what he's done. Is he is he like really smart? Is he like uh, like egghead smart? Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's him because he's a Q. Um, but uh, that was like definitely one of my favorite episodes, and and it must be one of yours too because people go around, you know, because because Q the Q. You know, the son of Q and Q, they're they're very sarcastic, and they like to uh, <laughs> mispronounce people's names. Like uh, he calls Catherine Katie, you know, and uh, and so like the whole thing about calling people um, by the wrong name is funny. And I did that a couple times myself today, um, but uh, but he liked to call you itchy, and you said that <laughs> he can do that as long as. He doesn't do that in front of the, uh, you know, executive officers or what do you call it, the uh, senior uh, the senior officers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so people call you what? People call you itchy, and uh, they also call you what? Board board. I get itchy and I get board boy quite a bit because I don't know. Maybe some people forget each head or something. But quite a lot of times at the convention, I'll be walking down the hall and somebody will go, "Hey, hey, uh, 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 board boy." <laughs> <laughs> that is such a funny name, board board. I I I, I got to do something with that. Um, Ian, um, have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard board board before? <laughs> Each um, no, no. I, I just saw like a uh, board boy. Is that is that is, is that Swedish? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, beyond board, personal board boy. There you go. Oh, I just had an amazing thought, um, uh, Manu. 
you should get your own line of like um, you know women's uh, you know underwear you know and uh, you know call it Borg Borg you know you can't call it Borg because there's already a Borg uh, thing but uh, wow I think I think I think oh no wait a second no you have a you have a serious girlfriend doing artwork right say that again. Okay, well, you, you don't want to make your girlfriend jealous is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> no, and I in, think, fact, I think, in fact, she designs underwear, so it's a, this this could work out. She 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 actually had a company called Sugar Speak and, and had poetry on panties. Um, so maybe she could do, design the board panties. Tell if, her if, to hey, board if, if there's a market for board panties, we'll, we'll get them made. Uh, yeah, tell her to put... Uh, tell her to get a new, whole new line of like uh, some kind of really sexy thong underwear, you know, with the board board, uh, you know, theme and uh, with your face on it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That would be really cool. But uh, yeah, no, no, no. I actually no, think really... that would work too. Well, the... be sure to make, make be sure to make sure your face is actually on the rear end side of the underwear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, if anyone out there wants wants to make those, I'd love it there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, um, um, Manu, did you get a chance to um see any of the artwork that I post today on Facebook? Artwork? Yes, I'm an artist. Uh, and did you the post entire it on my face? I posted on your face. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and no, no pun intended. On my page, you mean? Yes, your Facebook page. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, wow! Look at that. Yeah. All right, I'm looking at it right now. That's gnarly. Yeah. That's good work. Yeah, that's just pen, that's pen and ink, right? Yeah, this pen and ink. I did a a stipple of uh, Indiana Jones where I did a at first I did a penciled uh, a drawing of of him in Temple of Doom, like very lightly, and then I took um, an ink pen and I just you know, like a real ink pen, not just a regular pen with ink. With an ink pen, uh-huh. and I and I did, I did a dot, and, and it took me forever, and I didn't even finish it, but I like it unfinished, um, and uh, it was beautiful, and I did some really far out M. C. Escher type of of, of 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 drawings where you see these weird things flying through space. I'm sure you'll be able to see that, and uh, it was yeah, just, I'm uh, at the, and the pyramid. Yeah. The the, yeah. the ship the ship going through warp speed is pretty wild. Yeah, man. If you look closely at it, if you can zoom in, there's all kinds of detail inside every little crevice. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I love your artwork too. And uh, I thought that, and, and and by the way, that was one of my most favorite episodes of Jeff TV, um, where I was able to show all like almost all my old artwork. You know, and, and 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 because I did that, it was preserved for all time now. Um, oh, and, yeah, and, yeah. And it, yeah, they say when you start a uh, TV show like like in local access, in local access, that you should just do everything, everything that's you, and make it a part of you. You know, and and show you to everybody. So when I showed my artwork, I almost cried afterwards because I did so many good pieces of artwork that never got seen. And it got seen in not only in a TV episode, but with comedians like joking about it. It was really cool. I'll, I'll send you a link um, once yeah. I get it remastered. So, but um, I love your artwork too. And uh, can you give? Uh, hey, Ian, are we going to extend this episode? We're going to go into overtime. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to be able to log in in time and do it because I'm actually not logged into the Rock Talk Radio right now. Oh, so this is going to end real soon, huh? Pretty much, yeah. All right, well, I just want to thank you. Uh, let's talk again, Manu, um, and uh, especially on Facebook, especially about art, because I love your artwork. And uh, um, and uh, if you want to really quickly uh, uh, say uh, good night, um, uh, I am holding up my Vulcan peace sign with my hands and and uh, extending the uh, courtesy of saying, live long and prosper. All right, thanks for having me, Jeff. And uh, Ian, nice talking to you, man. Yeah, Onward. Great speaking to you too. All right. All right. I'm gonna beam you guys out. Here. out. Here we, here we go. <laughs> Blog Talk Radio. 
where millions of hosts and listeners gather. That's going to be some nasty pants. Well, there's some technicalities there, right? So what does remove really mean? Do, does it mean, you know, one leg off at a time is okay, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So I, if I if I had a pair of magic pants, would I get myself in trouble? Back in my early 20s, yeah, I would have partied. <laughs> now, no, I'd do the right thing with the money. <laughs> Wow, that's a great answer. Oh, my gosh. Because that is just, that gets my mind going because I, I would get myself in all kinds of deep doo-doo, and I would not be taking that off. Hey, we have another caller. Let's beam this caller in, too. Hold on a second. All right. Oops. I think he oh, shot the caller, dude. You can beam me in. That's the best thing. That's really nice, you know. You get a call and you're asking with a photon torpedo. I mean, what sort of what sort of show is this? <laughs> I pressed the wrong button, man. Be a real oh nice guy God. to your guest. Yeah, try not to kill the guests this week, Jeff. <laughs> hey, well, um, we have the pleasure of welcoming a very, very special guest. He's always a special guest. Um, he's the leader of Sci-Fi Pulse, uh, and we are talking with Ian Cullen. How are you, Ian? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, how are you guys? And hello, uh, is it uh, Manu? Yeah, that's me. I'm awful, man. This is just the worst day ever. This is so boring. <laughs> so, so I'm got, kidding. Got, got, I'm kidding. I've got the name right. It's Manu. Yeah. So I kept, I, kept, I kept thinking of the Muppets, you know. Manu, Manu. Manu, Manu. No, come on. That's... That's not Manu Manu. Yeah, wasn't it Manu yeah, Mork? It's, it's interchangeable. Manu Manu? That was Mork Manu Mork, wasn't it? It's Manu Manu. <laughs> yeah, Mork and Mindy did the... He did Manu Nanu, I think, right? Yeah, Shalom. Yeah, Manu Manu Nanu. Um, uh, Manu. <laughs> hey, you, you say Manu, Manu. 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 <laughs> Jeff, you should really get yourself a red jumpsuit like Mork had. You'd look flamming in it. Yeah. 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 Um, what, was, what was that question you asked about magic pants before, Jeff? Uh, well, well, I'll let I'll let uh, Manu answer that. It's uh, it's about a production he's doing um, called Ben Troubles. Is it Benjamin Troubles or just Ben Troubles? Well, right now it's called Benjamin Troubles, but that's the tentative title, and we're thinking of changing it to Ben Troubles just because it's easier. You know that we're it's the whole play on words with Benjamin Troubles. The kid's name's Benjamin. Films. And he's broken off and started directing now. And um, I got the lead role in that and then ended up executive producing a couple weeks into the shoot, too, uh, putting in some money. And um, it looks like we've got a good movie. We're trying to we're trying to squeeze squeeze the, the edit out by the Sundance deadline, which is like the 7th of next month. If we don't make it then, then it's a couple more months. But it's a, it's a movie about a kid with magic blue that, that finds a pair of magic blue jeans. This uh, down and out kind of graffiti street painter kid that has the worst day of his life and then gets blessed with a pair of magic blue jeans that create a hundred dollar bill on the hour every hour in the pocket, and uh, it's sort of a, a a dark comedy romance action guns gangsters sort of like a um, a, a softer version of um what's that guy that did Snatch and those type of films um. Uh, lock, stock, oh, and two smoking barrels. Guy Ritchie, right. sort of a guy, guy Ritchie type of thing, but with romance and a little softer than his films are. 
A little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely genre bending, but I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I do a lot of um, indie films, and about one out of four of them are uh, have any potential, and this one looks pretty good. It does look really good, and uh, I want to talk about this. I know that uh, um, our uh, my executive officer, uh, Mr. Goodnight, he's got a, a secret Starfleet mission he's got to get to um, fairly soon, but hopefully he can hang with us, and I wanted to get this in before he went, because I know he'd love the, just the idea of this story. I guess uh, some homeless guy um, gives the, gives Ben um, a pair of, uh, of magic jeans, and uh, did, uh, I have a lot of questions. Did the, did the homeless guy actually know that they they had magic? Well, it, there's a real there's you know I think that part of the movie is going to be really kind of up in the air who this guy is, where he came from, if he's even human, if he's a spirit, if he's just a homeless guy. It's a oh. there's a sort of, sort of a supernatural weird sort of an element going on that people at the end of the movie are going to have to figure the it out. Magic the man, so there's the, the yeah, that um, knocking off, if you will. It, w- when he gives the genes to Ben, he says, "Don't let these do to me what do to you what they did to me." And then he kind of disappears into the into the ether. So, um, you know, it's it's a movie about whether mo- you know whether money brings you happiness, and um, it's just it's also kind of like a Coen Brothers movie. I play the main character Ben, and Ben is usually just he's just kind of a laid back kid, sort of normal. Mm. But pretty much every character he runs into in the film is a complete whack job. You know, like how the Coen brothers, Coen brothers like to do that quite a bit. Where they they've got like all the supporting cast are completely strange. Um, wow! I don't know. I think it's, it's gonna be a funny film. I'm, I'm really cool. looking. We yeah, watch I'm really looking. Funny. Yeah, Mr. Goodnight. I am really looking forward to this, and I'm sure you could tell uh, Manu here all about the magic in your pants. Uh, but we won't get into that. Well, my pants are always <laughs> but, uh, magic. I, every pair of jeans I wear, whether I get them for $5 at the Goodwill, they're $100 jeans when I'm wearing them, my dungarees. <laughs> well, well. anyway, um, I have a couple questions uh, more about this uh, particular production. Um, like, uh, Manu, if you, if you actually were Ben and you had a chance as Manu, actually, um, as you, who you are right now. Way, oh, is, is it Manu? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Don't worry yeah, about it. Like, you say yeah, Manu, I say Manu. You say tomato. It's one of those kind of things. Uh, you know, it's yeah, a great right, I, I respond to anything relatively close. All right. Well, this is what I'm going to do for myself for mis, uh, mispronouncing your name. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Manu. Um, you can't talk after that. You're yeah, I'm going to say. I go to tell you the show. That thing was on stun. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm pretty strong, though. I've got, like, these por- personal force fields, so there's only, you know, 75% You've got your own shield. You know, damage. Is that what you're saying? You've got your own shield, your own personal shield. <laughs> yes. Who does yes. it? And when- you're behind the times, man. Go get one. It's like the iPhone 4. Come on. Get your personal oh, have shield. Oh, I've yet to download the shield app, I guess. Yeah, come on. Working! <laughs> so, uh... Anyway, before we get off on a tangent, because I'm not sure exactly how much time you have, Manu, um, but uh, I, I really got to ask you a couple things. Um, if you had the opportunity to have these magic pants, would you have fallen down that same road, uh, or do you think you would have gotten in bigger trouble, or do you think you would have uh, uh, invested wisely? Would you have waited? Would you have, or just spent every hundred as it came in? How would you have dealt with that? Here's the the, the 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 rules about the magic pants are if you, the rules come in the pocket and the rules are you can't remove them it's, they, it says do not repair and do not remove so in order to keep getting that hundred dollar bill every hour you you can't take the pants off and you can't repair them so if you ripped your crotch you'd basically have to go free balling for life you know well, they make it easy <laughs> to go to the bathroom though because if you can't yeah. more that sounds yeah, like you sound like a championship of... boxer. That would be a great name for a boxer. That's true. I should get into boxing, but I, I think at this point I, I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit you know being in my late twenties by this point I'm a little bit past my prime. But you know I could probably go for it, heavyweight class or something like that. Well, just the name should carry you for a couple of fights. 
That's true. That's true. Imagine the bias. I got to talk to Don King or whoever's <laughs> promoting these days. <laughs> There's only three of them. There's like a monopoly. It's Don King and a couple other guys. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I mean, the heavyweight class ain't what it used to be. So may, maybe I could, maybe I could bring something back into that. You know, maybe I could yeah. rejuvenate heavyweight boxing. Yeah, take on Klitschko, man. Do it. Yeah, I think I think I found a, a whole new vocation. I'm gonna have to start training after the show. Kids met. <laughs> True, faded, faded it is. Wow. Wow. So, so Manu, while we're talking about stand-up comedians, um, I hear. Um, do a little birdie that uh, that you've tried your hand at stand up comedy. How's that going for you? I, what little birdie told you that sort of thing? I I, uh, I think I you... mean I... <laughs> the great bird of the galaxy, maybe. You know what? I I have uh, you know around the, the last ten years or so when I go to the conventions, I'm always uh, on stage doing a little stand up, making people laugh. But uh, as far as throwing my hat into the, in a regular ring in, in L.A. I, you know, I always, I've always known I could do that and and can do that, but I'm not a, a huge fan of comedy, even though I'm, you know, decent at it. So no, I've never, I've never actually gone that route. I've always, that's like my backup plan. You know, if, if I don't um, make it in movies and television, then I'll go do stand up for a few years and make it that way. But at the moment, no. No, I can't recommend that one. The, the money is much better in the movies and TV. Much yeah, better. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. you know, so, um, can do it, man. Write a few jokes, get up on stage. I can do it. Yeah, I know you could. I knew you could. Um, I've got so many awesome questions for you. I mean, this is not going to be a boring episode. And uh, I was surprised as I was looking up some of your projects. There was a project that uh, that I'm really interested in um, that I want to get right to as long as we uh, started talking about comedy because this is kind of funny or it has a lot of funny potential. Um, yeah. You've been doing. Uh, I think you did a dark comedy called Ben Troubles. Is that it? Yeah, that is it. At, yeah. at, the, at the moment, the title is Benjamin Troubles. It's a half a million dollar dark comedy from Kai Efron, uh, who used to be the right-hand man as far as... Um, he was the uh, location manager for all of um, Christopher Nolan's... Films. Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. It's me, Jeff. I just beamed up to the... Jeff Trek Prize. <laughs> anyway, it's good to be back here on Jeff Trek, and uh, today we have a very, very special guest joining us. And uh, I've been wanting to talk to this guy for months, uh, actually for a couple of years, ever since I started Jeff TV, which we'll get to later. Uh, but this is Jeff Trek, and uh, I do have a lock on his coordinates, and uh, I'm going to beam him up right now. So. Uh, Oh, oh, before I even do that, um, I want to beam up my, my super-duper, awesome, charming co-host, um, Mr. Goodnight. Hold on, let me beam him in here, and uh, hold on, here we go. No, just keep those kind of accolades coming, Big Daddy. <laughs> good, to, good to see you, man. Good to hear from you. Um, welcome, Big Daddy. How are you today? I'm good. You know, man of the hour, top out, too sweet to be sour. And here right now, right now on, on the Jeff Pre- the Drift Prize and a, and a Trek Prize <laughs> and a Prize. <laughs> All right, listen, we have, we have a, the coordinates for our, uh, our latest guest, and uh, he's a big one. Um, his name is Manu Antarami, and uh, he played Echeb on Star Trek Voyager. He was in a great uh, big movie recently that I really enjoyed called Fortress and so much more. Let's just, let's just get a lock on, the com- uh, on him on our computer here. Hold on one second. We've got to be on that board. Get the yeah, audio we've got to beam him aboard. Yeah, yep, yeah, let's beam him aboard. What the heck, Jeff? I'm backwards. My butt's facing forwards. <laughs> that's a, that's a good night slide. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem they have with the transporter. You should get that looked into. Your transporter's all messed up, man. I knew I shouldn't have done that. 
That's because I cross-circuited to B. I should have cross-circuited to C. I gotta learn something from Scotty. <laughs> yeah. Engineering well, has really hit the skids around here. Yeah. Hit it again. So it's uncomfortable do. sitting on the other side. Oh. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Well, so, so Manu, where are you calling from? Uh, Los Angeles, California. Yay. Hollywood that's great. Uh, that's a good night off. from L.A. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. And hoping to get back out there again soon. I love it out there. Yeah. Mr. Goodnight. So, 